Speaking of things running their course, I think it's about time we talk a little bit of uh, Team Off Origins. And what better place for the Team Off Origins story to start with the origin itself? The very beginning. As many of you know, and have known, basically all the founding members of Team Off began in Arlington Heights. Hell, basically everybody in Team Off began in Arlington Heights, with the exception of one person. But the founders, the cornerstones, which would be the inception for the team, were all once part of the Arlington Heights Collective. Me, myself, my first year was, of course, in 2001. Mississauga Regionals was my first regional. And the same is true for Nikon. Nikon's first regional was also in 2001 in Mississauga. So basically, after a year, my first year playing, I was blown away. I had never imagined that the uh, talent pool could go that deep in this game. When I first started this game, I started off playing as most of the old players did back then. That, of course, being playing Friday nights and Saturday nights with my friends. I had uh, played for a good probably six months before I even got my membership, and that wasn't due to any particular reason that I didn't want to get a membership. It's that I didn't have a job. I was 17 years old. Um, freshly out of high school and freshly out of money, as basically the majority of high school kids. Sad to say that not a whole lot's changed today. So even for the games themselves, I was bumming, I was bumming five bucks or seven bucks or whatever it was back then from my friends I was with. I don't think I ever paid that back. But anyway, eventually I got my membership. And I think that was, actually, yeah, because my first time I ever played Laser Quest, just to go down memory lane here, was in 1999. It was late 99, fall. I don't think it was December, it wasn't near Christmas, but it was a little bit earlier than that, was when I played my first Laser Quest game. I remember going in there, I remember what the weather was like, and then I wouldn't see the inside of that center again until I would say it was about mid 2000. I think it was probably about May or June of 2000 because the weather wasn't warm yet, but it was warming up. My first NAC regional would be exactly one year after that in Mississauga. I had yet to start playing tournaments regularly, but there was some influence coming from a certain player that would change that very soon. Let's flash forward to regionals 2002 in Fairview Park. Once again, playing with the Arlington Heights Collective. And for those of you who are late to this game, or don't remember back that far, whose memory maybe is just failing them due to old age, as many of us are encroaching on, Arlington Heights was not a top-tier team. They weren't even a Tier 2 team. We were, I would say, an upper Tier 3 team. We'd feel good about ourselves bashing on the low Tier 3 teams, but we didn't really do a whole lot of anything else. Even when the region was easy as pie. The 2002 regional was by far and away the easiest regional I've ever participated in. Yet somehow, Arlington Heights failed to advance out of this region. Why? How? How? I look back on that, but I know the answer. For those of you who weren't aware, that was the year that they split Canada off from the North region and put them in the East, and they took what I would say arguably the worst half of the East region and put them in the North. That's not entirely true. We did get team fun, but the rest of the East region, which consisted of Centerville, a really bad version of Akron, Lexington, the uh, other half of Tennessee, Nashville and Memphis actually went South for some reason that year. So we got all of Ohio, and we got Lexington. Everyone else went east, including most of Canada. So yeah, literally. For some unknown, godforsaken reason, they decided to split Ontario up, where they sent everything north of Kitchener and Waterloo to the east that year, and everything south to the north. So to whatever fucking sense that makes, you couldn't ask for a better region if you're in the north that year, literally. If you were a team in the position that Arlington Heights was, I mean, it's as if the gods or corporate themselves were handing us a golden ticket to walk straight into nationals that year. <laughs> it was literally that ridiculous. But moving back to the point, 
that region was a region that I think even an upper tier 3 team could have advanced out of. Not one, not one consoles, but advanced out of, taken at least 5th or 6th, because back then, the North had one of the highest or the highest participation rates of all the regions. I think the only other region that had a better participation rate that year might have been the East. I don't think that's true, though. I think the North still had the most teams, because the North had the most teams in 2001, and then again in 2002... Or was it 2003? No, I think it was 2002 that we had the most participation because we advanced the top six. London advanced in that sixth place spot. Of all teams, London, who was basically an equal to us, made it to NAC that year. London, a team that never beat us in one NAC game, made it to NAC finals, to nationals that year. Arlington Heights didn't make it to the playoffs. Just to put it in perspective, to give you some context of what we're talking about, it came down to literally one game as to whether we were going to go to the playoffs or not. And that game was us versus Centerville versus Lexington. We did not, and I repeat, we did not have to win this game to make it to the playoffs, to make it to the ninth seed. We did not. All we had to do was take second and beat either Lexington or Centerville. Both those teams were in the running. One team was going to get eliminated. One team was going to take the ninth spot, the other was going to take the eighth, depending on who won. And spoiler alert, guess who didn't take either of that? And there was a reason, there was a reason for that. And that reason being is that our shining beacon of hope, our captain that year, Um, he decided, well, he didn't decide, but it turns out that he had forgot about certain obligations he happened to have that weekend. And those obligations being that his family owned a company, which he worked at, and that he had to work that weekend for that company. So, instead of doing the rational thing, doing the logical thing, and that would be to drop off the team that year, or at least relinquish your captainship. No, we we couldn't do that. That wasn't Arlington Knights' way. We didn't just let our captain walk away. So then came the ingenious, elaborate plan. Our captain would drive up with us at the start of regionals, then proceed to drive back on his own, to go to work Saturday night into Sunday morning and then somehow fly all the way back to Cleveland by Sunday morning before game time, before this game, our last game of prelims, was to go in. And I think you can figure out the rest. Our alternate wasn't viable that year. We took third place, one pity point against Lexington and Centerville. Two teams that at that point were on par with us, who we could have easily beaten. This was a breaking point for me. Personally, I mean. Not for the team, not for the people on the team, but for me. I was devastated. I knew the strength of this region. Now granted, we didn't show up with the best team overall that year. Our team in 2001 was nominally better, I would say. We lost Fireside from the year before. He was originally set to play on the team, but obligations got in the way. Uh, We lost Dark Dragon. Not the Rochester Dark Dragon, our Dark Dragon, but he was one of our best players in 2001. And we lost Zim. Zim had a broken arm that year. Couldn't try out. Well, he could, but it would have been difficult to play with your arm in a sling, so... This left us to pick up a player who did not make the team at tryout, so I believe was in 12th or 13th place. Um, Good guy, a lot of fun guy to have on the team, but uh, not much of an LQ player, unfortunately. And he would tell you that personally. And he blamed himself for that loss, and there was no way anybody, including myself, could blame him for that loss, and he should have been sitting out that game. But... Even if we had our one player, I had later come to the realization 
the cold, harsh realization that it wouldn't have made a difference. The attitude and mindset from the players, the older players of this team, the old guard, were going to hold us back from ever doing anything because the philosophy was fundamentally different. There, so there was a fundamental difference in philosophy between the younger players, the newer players, the hungrier players, and the old guard. The old guard was satisfied with simply showing up to one tournament a year, that being regionals. Showing up once a year, doing very few knack practice games, and knack practice games that they would do were incoherent, didn't have any direction, doing no tournaments throughout the year, and then showing up to regionals only to lose and then make excuses for the loss. This was the core philosophy of the old guard. And while I consider that old guard to be some of the best friends I've ever had, this couldn't stand. We couldn't keep going on like this. Pixie, one of the fundamental founders of the Darlingtons, you may remember them back in the day, made a t-shirt that year making fun of our team motto, which was DTA. Supposed to mean, don't trust Arlington. For some reason, we were going to try to not have collective references that year, and yet we somehow, when we printed that logo, it was in Borg lettering. So much for that. Anyway, Pixie made a shirt saying DTA, but they BSDJ too much. And she wouldn't tell, wouldn't tell any of us what that meant. Only a few people knew what that meant. I later found out what it meant. It wasn't anything cryptic or really insulting. But it was true. It was insulting. I found it insulting at first until I, after this regional. And then I realized, hit me like a ton of bricks, really, that that statement, that they BS DJ too much, was fundamentally accurate. So what does BS DJ stand for? They bitch smoke, drink, and jerk off too much. <laughs> now, some of those, maybe only, I think two out of those were true for me. I didn't bitch a lot. Okay, maybe three out of the four were true. But anyway, this would be the dawn of a new era. This would be the start of things to come as there was a slow influx of new members that were popping up. Namely, Falcon X and Raven, who had been playing on weekends and lock-ins, and who I had befriended in the coming months, shortly after regionals. And I had begun my crusade to make a difference, to turn Arlington Heights around, in the hopes that 2003 would be different than 2002. I had started to play a whole different game. See, back in 2001, shortly after the Mississauga Regional, Zim and I had driven around the area and gone to visit the LQs that we hadn't visited prior, namely Rockford and Appleton. Uh, it was a Sunday afternoon that we drove up, just a random Sunday, Zim picked me up and we drove up to Appleton, and it was just, uh, he had picked that day specifically because it was a practice day for them. And he had uh, contacted one of the members of the team and asked if it was okay if we joined them, and we did. And that was the first time I learned what a actual knack practice looks like. So in a lot of ways, when Appleton closed, it was kind of close to my own heart, too, because that was the place where I actually learned how to play Laser Quest for real. And that's the kind of attitude and intensity that I had wanted to bring to Arlington Heights and really didn't have the uh, the fortitude or the drive or want or desire to bring it until 2002 had happened. So in a way, I guess you can kind of lay claim to having Appleton credited also for the inception of Team Off. At least in some indirect way, I guess. So after that visit to Appleton, and of course the abysmal failure that was the 2002 Regional in Fairview Park, I would begin my mission. And that mission wasn't just to up my own competitive game, 
but also to preach the gospel of droid to anybody who would listen. My targets were primarily, of course, the new blood, the newer members that we had at our center that were showing a lot of potential, but also people in the old guard who had a lot of potential that was yet to be tapped, and also, you know, people that were receptive to it, like Nikon, for instance, he was, you know, instantly receptive to it, and, but I also had targeted older guard players like Tor, who really showed a desire to up their own competitive game, and a desire to not only be better as individual players, but be better as a team. But my most desired target was the brand new, fresh out of the package. Haven't played a single competitive Laser Quest game, unmolested, untainted. Members that were playing on Friday and Saturday nights and at lock-ins. Names like Falcon X and Raven and the players that played with them in that particular group. Those were the guys I really wanted to incorporate into the fold who didn't get an opportunity to. Falcon X, by the way, little known fact, actually signed up to try out for the 2002 NAC team in Arlington Heights. He just didn't end up trying out for a variety of reasons. And if you're wondering to yourself what the Gospel of Droid was, what were the, what were the words, what was the speech on the Silver Mount that I was, you know, espousing, it was just simply trying to... Uh, light a fire under a lot of the new members bellies to get them to start playing competitively because we had a lot of potential especially with somebody like Falcon X Falcon X was one of those rare players that you find that just you know you, you hear the term blue chipper and you don't really know what that is until you've actually met one and Falcon X was the first blue chipper I've ever met we then began playing side tournaments together I'd play my first out-of-state side tournament that year in Clinton Township, and it would be the start of a new era. Some people like to credit me for the start of this new era, but in retrospect, I really can't take all the credit that I think some would like to give me, because the reason why there was ever a gospel of droid, and the reason why there was ever this desire to light a fire under the new members in and really changed the way Arlington Heights played the game was because of Zim. It was Zim's influence. Zim is the one who would plant the seeds in my head about playing competitively and going to side tournaments. And when he was selling this to me, I was still rather new to the game. So I was kind of like, yeah, okay, whatever, man. Sure, let me know, whatever, you know, that kind of thing. And I didn't really put much stock into what he was talking about until I'd been to like two NACs and at that point I had started to realize some of the things he was saying about the team were true and I understand I would become to understand at least why there was this kind of lingering bad blood between him and the rest of the members of the collective I could never understand why he was never <sighs> He, it always was as if he was the dark horse and he was the uh, the odd man out. And while nobody expressed any specific dislike for Zim as a person, there was always this kind of raw attitude as to his place on the team by the rest of the old guard. And that, that's a story for another time, but it was really Zim. That's the point of all this. It was really Zim who who really, uh, he massaged the soil and he had planted the seeds in my head for how this game should actually be played. And he's the one who really, he's the one who kickstarted it all. He was the one who brought me to Appleton. And I would argue that's where everything really began. So, if it's true that I'm the one who laid down the roots for this all to happen... It would be Zim, who's the salesman on the side of the road who sold the beans. So as things got rolling, and as naturally things progressed, there was going to be a riff that was slowly forming between the new blood and the old blood. It's just kind of the natural course of things in these kind of matters. When you're trying to make substantial change, and there's an old guard that stands in the way of that, there's going to be dissension. And... 
While it wasn't overt or on the surface and there was no blatant hostilities one way or the other, at least not at this point, it was starting to be clear that there was a difference of philosophy and that one way or the other, for better or for worse, things were going to change and there might be a struggle in the foreseeable future for control of what direction this team was going to go in. This would lead us to the next chapter, which would be the jump from Arlington Heights to Hoffman, which I don't think anybody except for the people who are at the core of this really know the full story, and even then I think it's questionable as to what was the final straw that caused that to happen. So that'll be a story for next time. But yeah, I guess this is how uh, revolutions begin. However minor, small, and as trivial as this particular revolution may be, actually be.